If I was to ask you the question, what does it mean to be Australian? I wonder how you'd answer. You know, what would you say are the essential aspects or characteristics of being Australian? In 2019, a survey of 55,000 people was done asking that very question. They were asked to nominate the key elements of what it was to be Australian, and they were given a list of 12 things to choose from. Being born in Australia, having Australian citizenship, speaking English, living most of your life here, and the list went on. And with each of these categories, those surveys were asked to indicate how important they felt that particular category was, that particular characteristic was. And according to the 55,000 people who took part in the survey, the characteristic that rated the highest was respecting Australian institutions and laws. That was number one, respecting Australian institutions and laws. A survey that was done a couple of years earlier found similar results. They found that 96% 90, of people surveyed said that respecting Australian political institution and laws was either important or very important, the highest of all the categories listed. Does that surprise you? That this is considered the most essential characteristic to being Australian, respecting Australian institutions and laws? It surprised me a bit. And I also thought it was quite ironic given that the European settlement in this country was founded or based on people who did the exact opposite. But there you have it. The number one characteristic of being Australian is to respect our institutions and laws. Now if someone was to ask you the same question with regards to the Christian life, how would you respond? What would you say are the essential characteristics when it comes to being a Christian? Because this is the question that we're going to consider today. In the passage we're looking at this morning, which was the second part of the passage read out to us, Peter spells out to the readers some of these essential characteristics. And in doing so, he focuses on two in particular, two that were particularly relevant to those he was writing to, and particularly relevant for us today. So you remember last week, we looked briefly at the situation of those that Peter was writing to, the situation they were facing. They were being slandered and insulted and abused and ostracised for their faith in the Lord Jesus. And because of this situation they found themselves in, some of them were likely considering, well, is this worth it? Maybe if I just compromise my faith, I can do away with some of this pain and abuse and suffering. And so Peter writes to them with two aims. Firstly, he encourages them to stand firm in the faith, in the truth that they know. And secondly, he reminds them of the true grace of God, he says. And in doing this, there were three main areas. In, in outlining the true grace of God, there are three main areas that Peter focuses on in his letter. The first area is who we are in Christ, how God has saved us in Christ, who we've become in Christ. And Peter focuses in, on, on that part in the first part of the letter, up until around chapter 2, verse 10. The second thing Peter focuses on in this letter is that he reminds Christians how they're to live in light of God's mercy and God's grace with a particular focus on the situation they were facing. And Peter takes the majority of the middle part of the letter, focusing on that, from 2.11 to 4.11, and our passage makes up part of that section. And then the third thing that Peter focuses on in the letter is the question of suffering and facing trials for your faith. And we're going to look at that next week. This week, however, we're looking at what Peter says to his readers about the qualities and characteristics of the people of God. And the passage we're looking at, which is the second part that was read, is the conclusion to a section that started with the first part that was read, 2, 1 to 11. And in this section, 
Peter outlines and talks about the way that Christians should respond in various situations. And he concludes in 3, 8 to 12 by giving a general summary of this, of how Christians are respond to one another and how they're to respond when they're insulted. And he starts with how we are to respond to one another, how we're to respond to those that are part of the community we're in, that are part of our church. Have a look at verse 8 with me. There Peter says, Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Now this, according to the Apostle Peter, is how Christians are to treat one another, how you and I are to treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. And he listed five characteristics, didn't he? The first one being like-minded, or as one commentator puts it, of shared heart and mind. Now, in Peter's time, this word was often applied to close friendships or an ideal friendship. A close friendship was one that was of one heart and mind. And the idea behind this is conforming our individual needs and goals and expectations to the purposes and needs of the group, of the friendship or of the church. And so when thinking about church, as Peter is here, there is... If there's something that we might not personally want to happen here, yet we recognise that it's best for God's people as a whole, then we will willingly and joyfully get on board. That's part of what it is to be like-minded. The second characteristic is being sympathetic, or other translations have understanding. And what stands behind this word is the idea of having an attitude and a desire of mercy towards people, particularly people in need. And the word was originally used in the context of the household and particularly had mothers' relationship with their children in view. See, children are often weak and vulnerable, aren't they? They're needy. They, they need to be looked after. They need to have mercy shown to them. And to do this well, we need to make an effort to try and see things from the child's perspective, to try and understand what they're going through, what they're experiencing. And Peter says that's what it's to be like between us in the church. The third characteristic that Peter mentions is loving one another. Well, the word he actually uses is the word for brotherly love, or that is the love of a family member. And I was a bit worried that the children's talk was going to hijack this point, but Simon brought it around well. That was good to hear. (laughs) Hopefully you have experienced the love of a family member in a positive sense. You know, that love that sacrifices for the other person, that love that doesn't act based on the question of what am I going to get out of this, but rather acts on the, the assumption or acts knowing what is best for other people. We're to have this love for one another, Peter says. The fourth characteristic mention is compassion, being compassionate. And for us, the term compassion can often conjure up ideas of acting out of pity towards someone. I'm going to have compassion on that poor person. And while Peter no doubt had wants us to act like that, what he likely had in mind was the idea of the kindness and tenderness shown to family members. That was what the word meant back then, kindness and tenderness shown to family members. See, this is what Peter has in mind with how we're to treat one another, with that kindness and tenderness we have towards family members. Now, maybe you've noticed a particular emphasis on the characteristics that Peter has chosen. Three out of the four characteristics we've mentioned so far refer to the family context, relationships within the family, And the fourth one, like-mindedness, the first one we looked at, was applied to a close friendship. Three in the familial context, one in the context of close friendship. And in many cases, we'll often treat these two groups in similar ways, won't we? In fact, close friends are often referred to as being like a family member. That was certainly the case for me 
my closest friend, he was like a brother to me. We spoke regularly. We wanted to hear each other's opinions on what was happening in our lives. We were concerned with what was going on with the other person. We shared deeply with one another. And as well as this, we treated each other as family members in other ways. We showed kindness in ways that we would have to family members. We were willing to compromise more easily on more things and let little annoyances stay little annoyances and not become big things and forgive and forget. And it is this sort of image that Peter is giving of the church. This is what we're meant to be like with one another. This is how we're meant to act towards each other, Peter says. And the fifth and final characteristic that he mentions is one that further emphasises this. It's one that really underlies all of them. It's the foundation to the previous four. And that fifth characteristic is humility. Now, humility is not, generally speaking, a desired characteristic in our culture, nor was it in Peter's culture. Both in Peter's society as well as in ours, humility was and still is viewed as being synonymous in some ways with weakness. If you're humble, it's because you're weak. God does not see humility like this. The most humble person who ever lived, the Lord Jesus, was anything but weak. Paul describes this humility of Jesus in that wonderful passage in Philippians 2, those verses I'm sure you're all familiar with. He describes Jesus as being in very nature God, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And just a few verses prior to this, Paul has defined what humility is. He says to the Philippians, humility, humility is valuing others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is not weakness. This is love. This is living the way God made us to live. And this is how God wants us to live amongst each other. This is how God wants his church to treat each other. As a family who prioritises close, caring, intimate relationships and has the disposition of putting others first, looking out for others' needs before our own. And in the small amount of contact I've had with this church, it seems to me that many in this church display many of these characteristics. Like-minded, sympathetic, loving, compassionate, humble. Let me encourage you to keep pursuing them both individually and corporately as God's family. Pray for these individually. Pray for these as a church. Keep praying for one another. Ask God to continue to help you develop these characteristics in your life personally and in your, the church as a whole. And maybe as you look at that list, you notice one or two that you particularly struggle with. Maybe it's been like-minded or compassionate or humble. Pray specifically for these. Pray more for these. Ask God to develop them. Look for opportunities to practice them amongst each other. Because these are the qualities that define God and his church. And having listed the qualities of character that shape Christians and the way they deal with one another, Peter then goes on in the next verse to address how his readers should respond when things are at the opposite end of the spectrum, when people insult you and treat you badly. Have a look at verse 9. There Peter says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called. Now Peter here speaks directly to an issue that his audience was facing. They were being insulted. 
people were abusing them and treating them badly because they were following the Lord Jesus. And maybe you're facing something similar at the moment. Being ridiculed, insulted, treated unjustly. But Peter says when these sort of things happen, we are to do two things. Or really he says we're to do one thing and avoid doing another. And he starts with the bit we're meant to avoid. Peter says, he, he, Peter says that we are not to pay back in kind. We're not to fight fire with fire, so to speak. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, he says. Now, his exhortation is the exact opposite of what our world says to do, isn't it? Our world says insult for insult, slander for for slander, abuse for abuse. Our criminal and justice systems are filled with the result of people living this way. Road rage and neighbourly disputes are the fruit of thinking this way. Churches split because unfortunately some Christians act this way. Insult for insult, slander for slander, abuse for abuse. Not the followers of Jesus, Peter says. If insulted, don't insult back, he says. If slandered, don't slander back. If abused, don't abuse back. This, however, was only one part of Peter's message about this subject, the what not to do. Peter also tells the Christians what they are to do in situations like this. Rather than fighting fire with fire, trading insult with insult and evil with evil, Peter says to the Christians, repay evil with blessing. Now notice what Peter is saying here and what he's not saying here. He's not saying that if someone insults you or wrongs you, simply ignore them. I know if I do that, I feel like I've done the right thing. Peter's saying we need to go further. See, doing nothing in these situations is not the way we're meant to respond. He says we're to pay back evil with blessings. That is, we're to ask God to show favour and grace upon those who have insulted us and treated us badly. And the underlying principle here is that Christians are to always be characterised by doing good and never characterised by doing evil, even when evil is done to them. And that's the point that Peter wants to make in the last few verses of this passage. Have a look at verses 10 to 12. Peter there, he's quoting from Psalm 34. He says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must speak peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Those who are God's people, Peter says, must turn from evil and do good. They must keep their tongues from evil and their lips from speech that deceives. They must seek peace and pursue it. Now maybe you're sitting here feeling a little bit discouraged at this point. Or maybe even a little cynical. It's one thing for Peter to say this is how we act. It's another thing altogether to actually do it and to expect that we really do it. And I remember a number of years ago hearing a wise and godly minister of mine talking about this issue, you know, living in ways that just seem impossible to live, seem unrealistic. And he said that when we're thinking about these sort of things, it's important that we remember two truths. The first truth is that God acts 
towards, sorry, the first is that God acts towards us in the same way that he's asking us to act towards others. God has not repaid our evil towards him with evil. Rather, he's repaid it with, repaid it with great blessing. Blessing beyond compare, as we saw last week in that wonderful passage at the beginning of this letter. And in this, Jesus is an example for us as well, isn't he? As Peter talks about it in this very letter. As Peter points out in 2 verse 23 that Jesus didn't repay insult with insult or suffering with threat or evil with evil, but rather humbly died for his enemies to bring blessing beyond compare. See, these are the family traits, the traits of our father and of our older brother. This is what characterises those who are part of God's family. After Queen Elizabeth II had been on the throne for a few years, she was asked what it was that characterised her and the royal family. And she responded by saying, duty and a dedication to one's country. They're the family traits, she said, for the royal family. The royal family, the traits of the royal family are duty and a commitment to one's country, to serving one's country. The family traits of the king of the universe and those that he has given new birth are doing good instead of evil and repaying insult with blessing. And the second thing that's important for us to understand and remember this minister said is that God doesn't leave us by ourselves when it comes to living this way. God helps us. God enables us. He gives us his spirit who is committed to changing and transforming his people, those who led him into the likeness of the Lord Jesus. It's God's spirit who will enable us to refrain from paying insult with insult or evil with evil and instead allow us to repay insult with blessing. It's God's spirit who will enable us to be like-minded and sympathetic and compassionate and loving and humble. And we need to ask him and continually ask him to help us with these things. And this is something that Jesus encouraged his disciples to do as well. At the end of perhaps his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. See, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives a picture of what his followers are to be like. A picture that really seems impossible to follow and fulfill, doesn't it? Love for enemies, not worrying, turning the other cheek, not judging, being perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And having finished the sermon... Jesus says these words, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. See, Jesus is saying here, it is impossible for you to do these things by yourself. You can't. You can't live the way God has made you to live by yourself. You need his help. You need to ask him. And he gives to those who ask him. So let me encourage you, as I did last week, to come to God and ask. Ask God to build these characteristics and attitudes into your life. Ask him to prompt you when things happen and help you by his spirit to follow his way. When that person at work or at school insults you or abuses you because you're a Christian. Or when that family member ridicules you because of a decision you've made, because of your faith in Christ. When that happens in those moments, ask God to help you repay that insult with blessing. Or when you find it hard to love or be compassionate to that person at church or when you find it hard to be like-minded on a particular issue 
then pause and ask God to equip you with those characteristics in that moment. To love and to be compassionate with that person you find it hard to love and be compassionate with. And we're not only asking these things for our sake, but really we're doing it for the sake of God's church and his name. A unified, loving church, a church that repays evil with blessing is one that stands out and testifies to the grace of God. It's one that testifies to the fact that there is a better way to live. God's way. Let's pray.